Amen. So last week we, we talked about armor number one, right? We went through the, uh, the, the armor that we went through had to do with girding our loins with truth, the belt of truth. It also talked, we also talked about the breastplate of righteousness, and we talked about our feet being shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Amen. And so I'm going to go back and I'm going to read the whole passage of scripture again. And it starts in, it's in Ephesians chapter six and it's starting in verse 12. It says, for we wrestle not. Oh, well, I'm sorry. Let's go, let's go back to a verse, uh, verse 10. Let's start at verse 10. It says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness and high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And for me, he says, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Praise God. Father, we just ask you for your help, Holy Spirit. I need you to move, Lord God, I need you to speak through me. I pray that you would use me as a mouthpiece to bring forth your truth to your people, Lord God. And Holy Spirit, help the hearer receive your truth and help it, Lord God, to minister to their walk and strengthen them. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. The fiery darts of the wicked. I was, uh, I was not, I didn't get a visual like I talk to y'all about sometimes, but I imagined as I was studying the text, this particular scenario. I can imagine almost like if it was in a video, if I was trying to write a book and help you to describe it to you, is that there's a guy and his name is Christian and he's hunkered down in the field and the grass is really tall and the, 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 the night sky is being lit up by fiery arrows. They're whistling by. But the, light, but the sky is lit up with the flames of the arrows and there's a fortress to his left and there's a fortress to his right and the arrows are initiating over here to his left and it's dark outside. The only thing that's lit up is the sky from the fiery arrows. And the reason that it's dark is well in ancient times they didn't have electricity. If you're more of a modern warrior guy then guess what? The enemy docked out the power grid. There's no electricity. It's dark. He's not supposed to be in darkness but he is in darkness and he's not supposed to be in the field. He's not supposed to be in the field. He's supposed to be on the other side over there where the arrows are being slung. But he's Christian, but he's not operating like Christian. He doesn't have his armor, and he's hunkered down in the field hiding in some grass. And he's really kind of stricken by a spirit of fear right now. And he doesn't know what to do. And to make matters even worse, he knows that those arrows are pounding his home. Yes. Boom. Pounding the place that where he belongs and he's not part in unity of the place where he belongs. I don't know exactly why he is where he is. You'd have to figure that one out for yourself. You can plug in a blank for yourself. He was offended at some point in time and could never get over it. He opened up a doorway to sin and allowed sin to come in. And then he couldn't close the door like he thought it was going to be easy to do. And it's just had its way in his life. He doesn't, I mean, he's just unhappy with some things in his life. I mean, whatever, however you want to plug it in, but he was letting it get the best of him. And he's not learning how to allow the gospel of Jesus Christ to have its way and to work its way in his life. He turned to something else, maybe. You know, yeah, Jesus is good, but, but he didn't know how to get through this one battle that he was in. And so he believed a lie, maybe. 
believed a lie that the world had something to offer that could help him in addition to his Jesus. It's good that you have Jesus. That's what, that's what they told him. The, the, the Judaizers came in to the Galatian region and they, after the apostle Paul and let them say, oh good, you got Jesus. You needed that, but now you got to add circumcision to your faith. No, you got Jesus, but see, the problem that you have requires AA. I said it. I did. You have Jesus, but the problem that you have requires boom, 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 whatever it is, fill in the blank. No. When you have Jesus, you have enough. You have to, hallelujah, yeah, when you have Jesus, you have enough. The problem is, is that we may not have a proper understanding of the word of God. And it, and it beholds the true believer that he would take the time and the diligence to dig into the word of God and to believe what the word of God says and to allow it to equip him. Amen. And that's what the armor is all about because it's all interconnected to Jesus and it's all interconnected to the word. But Christian now is in darkness and he's in the grass and they're hitting near his home and he will either learn to fight. Christian will either learn to fight God's way or he will be pummeled <laughs> under the pressure. Amen. Times are changing, my friend. The church is different right now today than it's ever been before. Yes. And he may be pummeled under the pressure and he may quit. It is possible for Christians to quit. I'm not trying to tell you that it happens all the time. I'm not trying to tell you that just because somebody misses a few Sundays, that means they quit. That would be ridiculous. But what I'm trying to tell you is don't think that Christians don't start the race good but never finish. It, we have a type in the Old Testament during the time frame of Joshua where many a people died in the Sinai Desert because they couldn't make it through to the other side because they couldn't believe in the Lord. They'd be, there's many POWs and casualties in the kingdom. Oh, where is his faith? Where is his armor? Did he leave his shield of faith behind? How could he forget his faith? Suddenly, he sees a remnant marching from where he knows he's supposed to be. They're out there, and they got their shield of faith. They're coming out, and they're like, look, look, look the arrows are coming. They're like, oh, no, I'm not staying here anymore. It's time to advance. And they're moving forward. They're moving forward in the battle, and they got their shields. And when he first sees them, he wants to scream out, but he's not going to do it because he's concerned he'll give up his position. Right? So he just stays in the lives there quiet. He wants to say, no, don't do it. Are you crazy? Your little bitty shield is never going to be able to take those arrows. But then all of a sudden he starts rubbing his eyes and he like blinks a couple of times and he's like he, he shakes it off because he thinks he's hallucinating. It looks as though every step that his brothers and sisters take their shields getting bigger. <laughs> their faith is getting bigger. Hallelujah. And ain't going to be no kill shots today because they're walking behind the shield of faith. They picked it up. They believed what God said in his word. And they started to move forward instead of laying up in that field stricken by a spirit of fear. Hallelujah. Let's talk about faith and arrows a little bit. I just want to use one scripture out of Matthew 8 to start with. Matthew 8 chapter 24. It says, and behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, and so much that the ship was covered with the waves, but he was asleep. And then his disciples, they came to him, and they woke him up, and they said, Lord, save us, we're perishing. And he says unto them, why are you fearful, O you of little faith? And then he arose, and he rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. But the men marveled, saying, what manner of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? Amen. He's a man of faith. That's what the Lord was showing me. Jesus was a man of faith and he's come to show us the way. And we no longer have to live under fear, but instead we can live under faith. And in the next verse, verse 28, it says, And when he came to the other side into the country of the Gergesenes, there met him two possessed with devils coming out of the tombs, exceeding fierce, so that no man might pass that way. See, he was, he, there was an assignment. On the other side of the storm. Amen. We can rest assured that when we need faith, we, well, we always need faith. Amen. But when we exercise our faith, that God's going to show up. Whether the storm is physical, whether the storm is spiritual, yes. I'm here to tell you, Lord, I have faith, but where I don't have enough faith, 
Please heal my faith. Yes. Increase yes. my faith. That as I walk like my brothers and sisters, I'll see my shield of faith growing bigger. And I'll learn how to continue to trust you in the midst of the battle. Yes. Amen. Because God wants you and I to be able to move forward in the assignment. Yes. If he's calling you to go into the Morgan City Jail, he wants you to be able to have a shield of faith that will help you to get up in there. If he's calling you to go somewhere to bring Jesus to somebody, no, he is calling you to share your faith with somebody. I need you to know that. Because that's what God put you on this earth for so that he can do a work in you and then use you to, to, to speak truth to another person. I believe that. In some way, shape, or form to communicate the truth to someone else. We're not all blessed with the gift of music. Not that musicians shouldn't be witnesses also, but I'm just saying, I mean, that's another that's another gift that proclaims the gospel. That's the way I see it. It's another gift that proclaims the gospel. Amen. Hallelujah. We can rest assured that if there's an assignment, amen, on the other side, the Lord is going to show up for us. Praise God. First John chapter five, verses four through five says, whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world. Sometimes Christians can't really move forward because they're never able to seemingly really overcome the world. The world still has dominance in their life. The world still calls their name and they find themselves weakened and under the pressure. They find themselves going back into the world. But the word of God says right here, this is what the word says. Whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world. Even our faith. Who is he that overcomes the world? But he that believes Jesus is the Son of God. I know you believe that this morning. One of the things that the Lord is making even more clear to me in his word is this, is that this is his word. And he's asking me, even as a pastor, as a preacher for as many years as I've been believing this Bible, he's saying, will you believe my word? Will you believe what it says? If I tell you you have victory, will you believe it? If I tell you that you can walk in victory over the demonic realm, will you believe it? If I tell you that you can believe in the supernatural and I'll show up and heal somebody, will you believe it? Amen. That's what his word says. The only thing I know to tell you to do is to continue to pray and to believe it. Because I'm realizing something too. It's not my job to make it happen. It's my job to believe that he's already done the work that needs to be done in order for it to happen. And he's asking me on this earth to believe with him. Amen. He's the son of God and all power and authority has been given or placed in him. And listen, he released it to us as saints. Yes. There's a scripture that I've been using a lot. I want to clarify it. But in Luke chapter 10, verse 19, he said this. He said, behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall hurt you. Now, what I want you now, what I'm telling you right now, scorpions and serpent, serpents represent demonic entities. They represent the forces of darkness. And a lot of times, whenever I've been using this scripture, I've been using it lately in the sense of seeing deliverance of demonic spirits. But I want you to know that there's more to this text than that. There's also the fact of you and I walking in victory over the power of demonic spirits in our own yes. personal life. Yes. Amen. This is more than casting out devils, but it's also talking about walking in victory. Amen. Uh, as we move forward in the battle, we can't move forward in the battle and walk in victory if we're hiding in the grass and we're stricken with fear because the enemy is getting the best of us. Romans 6, 20, 16, 20 says this. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. It's the Lord that crushed Satan on the cross. And it's the Lord that, will, that crushes Satan under our feet today. It's his work. It's his victory. And it's time for us to believe it and to begin to walk in it. I was going to try to do a pop quiz on you to see if you remembered anything from last week. And I was going to say, I just crushed the serpent's head. What's on top of his head and what's underneath my feet? My feet are shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. I have the gospel of peace underneath my feet, and that's what I got on top of his head. Whenever the Lord gives me the victory, he's already given me the victory to crush his head. Amen. Hallelujah. No unclean has, thing has to touch me. Praise God, because I've been prepared in the gospel of peace. Amen. I believe that. But we have to have faith in what his word says. I don't believe in the, in the, in the word of faith movement. <laughs> I don't believe in the word of faith movement, but I do believe in faith in his word. That's right. 
Talk about fiery darts a little bit. We talked about faith. Seven times that word fiery is used in the New Testament. Most of the time it's in a negative connotation. But some of the ones that show up, it means to be inflamed. And the idea is that you could be burning with anger. You could be burning with grief. You could burn with lust. And you can burn with jealousy. So those fiery darts that he's shooting and he's trying to hit with us, he wants to find a, he wants to find a spot to get inside your armor. And he wants that thing to sit there and just smolder there. And if there's a little bit of an open door where we're like, mm, let me open that up a little bit. And you let that in there, whether it's lust. Dude, that's a mess. How you know, preacher? Unfortunately. Most men can tell you, and it's not just men. Women have problems with it too. You open up that door, sometimes that thing don't want to leave. It's strong. But guess what? The victory of the cross will tear that thing apart. Amen. You tear it up, wide it up, throw it out. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Jealousy. Sometimes you don't even realize whenever jealousy is coming over you. But jealousy will start trying to grab a hold of you. Grief. Sometimes grief will bring you down. Anger. Sometimes we'll get burned up with anger before you know it. And like I'm telling you, you'll have a spirit, spirit of anger come over you. And you'll feel so irritated and frustrated. Yeah, and you can't hardly get nothing done because you just all tore up on the inside. He's trying to fortify his position in our lives by striking us with these fiery darts. But the word of God says that we're equipped with the shield of faith. And all we have to do is pick it up and to walk and to believe in his word and to have faith in his word. The next passage talks about the helmet of salvation. And then, you know, that in the helmet of salvation, so it's saying that the helmet is directly connected to salvation. Amen? Salvation, let me just say a couple of things. This is a little bit of teaching moment here. Salvation results in God's spirit living in you. I'm not going to go to all the scriptures to prove it to you, but I'll tell you some of them. John 14, right? 1 Corinthians 6, 17. Where, where Jesus promised that the spirit of God would one day be in the inside of disciples. Ezekiel 36, 25 through 27. Says that there was a new covenant coming where the spirit of God would now live on the inside of man. And the reason that all that can happen is because Jesus died on the cross. See, if Jesus wouldn't have died on the cross, then the Holy Spirit couldn't come live on the inside of man. See, the book of Hebrews says that the blood of bulls and goats could not remove sin. But the blood of Jesus removes sin when you get saved. And once sin is removed, now the Holy Spirit moves in. That's how you know you're saved. Because when the Holy Spirit's in your heart, you can't keep living the way you used to live because the spirit of conviction will get a hold of it. Right. So so the helmet of salvation is directly connected to salvation and salvation results in God's spirit living in you. And God's spirit renews our mind and changes our mindsets and our outlooks. And so I'm using the mind connected to the helmet in that way because it's on top of your head. <laughs> the illustration, though, that I imagine in this battle that we're talking about is that there's an enemy combatant with a club. And he's repeatedly battering a believer upside the head. Now, I'm just telling to tell you, I'm not trying to tell you he's going to win the battle because the believer does have his helmet on. But I'm just, if you could just imagine, he's standing there. Because in reality, we may not like to believe that believers could be battered on their noggin by the enemy. But what I'm trying to remind you of is that the Apostle Paul was literally battered on his head with sticks three times literally. They beat his head with sticks. They beat Jesus on the head with rods, the Bible says. They kept hitting him on the head and laughing at him and ridiculing him and blindfolded him and slapped. Okay, you get the point. So these things happen to them physically and spiritually. Many times believers are being bombarded in their mind by the enemy. He's trying to buffet them. And I imagine this club and he's just like, poof. And he's just sitting there just taking a beating. I was going to ask Sabrina to share a testimony on that note. Does this microphone work? Or probably not. Yeah, yeah it can. <laughs> Everybody's got a job. <laughs> testimony. Yeah. Testimony. Where are you? Did you want a mic? They might be able to be better on the video. You don't have to come all the way out. You can just turn it off and be done. Right now. 
right? But oh. I, let me just say this. I asked, I was talking to Sabrina, I've talked to four to five other people since then, and I just didn't want it to take up the whole service. So I only asked Sabrina to give the testimony, but I know for a fact that other people have agreed that the same thing's been happening to them. So she was willing to do it, so I asked her to do it. Okay, so Wednesday night when I came to church, um, I walked in the door, and I think even Danielle had said something to me. Maybe it wasn't just Wednesday, it may have been Sunday too, because even Danielle said, what was wrong with you today? You look, you look like something wrong, but so Wednesday night I come into church and the thoughts that are going through my head, I'm thinking, is this even where I belong? And I've been here since, since the Bible study. Since the Bible study, you know? And I'm thinking, do I even belong here? Like, I don't even, and I'm just thinking, oh my God, I don't want to talk to nobody. I just don't like nobody, you know? Like all these things are going through my brain and I'm thinking something's wrong with, you know? And of course you're thinking something's wrong because it's not normal. You don't normally think like that, but I mean, it was very intense, and um, I was just back here, and I just could not get into praise and worship um, just because of the thoughts that were going over my, my head, and and really, I thought, I probably should just leave, you know? Well, anyway, Brother Kirk went up when he was preaching, and he started rebuking the spirits, and he started casting out spirits, and by the time he got done, I was able to worship. So what I told Matt, I told Matt, I said, you know, I've really struggled. I said, I've really been struggling, you know, just not even thinking that I belong here. But um, I said, so imagine if I'm struggling like that, how many other people are struggling and they're giving into that struggle and they're thinking that something's wrong with us, with the church. This isn't the right church, you know, because at the flip side of that, I think, okay, so if I do leave, where am I going to go? <laughs> you know, like... I mean, I there's only probably one thing that Matt's ever said that maybe I disagree with, but for 99.9% .9 pretty much everything he says, I'm in agreement with him, and that's why the Lord led me here in the first place. I mean, he led me, brought Robert back into my life. You know, we were all in one mind, all thinking the same thing, and um, because I was listening to Swagger, and I was just like, Lord, I need people to listen to Swagger, and then here comes Robert, and Robert says, i got to introduce you to somebody. Here comes Matt, and then he says, i got to introduce you to somebody else, and here comes Wade, you know, and so, and there, like, all these people that were coming together that all believed the same, and so my point is, is that if I left here, where would I go? I mean, I'm in one accord with the way I believe, you know, as far as the gospel is concerned. So it was a spirit. So the whole point in all of that is exactly what we're reading. I mean, if he, the enemy is real and he wants to destroy what we have here and he wants to bring division and we have to recognize, including myself, have to recognize when there is something, there's an attack because we are all under attack. I believe yes. that. Yes. I really do. I mean, and, you can just turn it off and hold it. I'll get it from you later. Amen. I appreciate that. I do. Uh, cause, because, look, I want you to know that Satan wants to attack your body, your physical body with sickness, but he certainly always starts with our minds, and he did that with Eve in the garden when he began to attack her and began to question her about what the truth was. Yes. And, you know, has God said, right? And, um, you know, but, but at the same time, the Word of God teaches us in Ephesians, he says, it says, be renewed in the spirit of your mind that you... Put on the new man, which is created in Christ Jesus. And a new mind is a renovated mind. Yes. Right? And 1 Corinthians 2.16 says that we have the mind of Christ. And if we have his mind, then we should start to think like him. I've been thinking about the, the renewed mind. And I've been thinking about the mind of Christ a lot lately. And how through the process of time after I got saved and the Holy Spirit living in me and studying the word of God. How... Because as I've become more proficient, I got a long way to go, but as I've become more proficient in the word of God, it's begun to change my mindsets and it, and it changes the lens through which I view the world that I'm living in, if that makes sense. And, um, you know, one of the questions that I was going to ask, because she made a couple of comments, she said, if I did leave here today, I'm going to challenge you this morning. I'm going to challenge you a little bit. And I don't want you to take it the wrong way. I really did pray about this message. 
And I prayed that the Lord would help me to deliver it the right way. I promise you I'm not here to antagonize anybody. The devil's already antagonizing enough people. I want to operate under a spirit of unity. I want to operate under a spirit of love. But I do have some things that I feel like the Lord would want me to say or to ask. And, uh, you know, I didn't prompt her to tell her what to say there. I did ask her, though, whenever she told me that she was experiencing that. I'm like, well, sis, do you think that's the truth? And she's like, no, it's a lie. I'm like, all right. I'm not over here trying to get you to agree with me. Because if you feel that way, then it sounds like you got some praying you need to do. You got some praying you need to do. You need to figure out where the Lord's going to send you if you're not supposed to be here. I don't mean to pick on her, but if she said, I don't like nobody here, then I knew right away you got you to look at the problem. Right? I mean, I'm not picking on Because sometimes I'm like, dude, I don't really like this people. Guess what? That's your problem, Pastor. Your problem, buddy boy. What are you trying to say, Pastor? You don't like us? Of course I love you. But you get the point. The enemy wants to come in. All right. This was one of the questions I want to ask. Do we live in the last days? Whoever doesn't think that we're living in the last days, raise your hand. Okay, that, uh, I just want to make sure that we're at least starting on level ground here. So, y'all already heard my story many times, so I don't mean to overdo it, but God called me with a very specific word back in 01. Remember that? He told me, present your, my word for the way that it is written and I will use you. I mean, no, he, called, he showed up in a very profound way and he spoke to my spirit and my life has never really been the same. Now, I thought that I knew what that meant. I thought that just the simplicity of understanding the message of the cross was all that entailed. And now I realize that there's even that there's more to it. Now, don't get me wrong. Without understanding the message of the cross, without understanding Romans chapter 6, it could have never been a springboard to, to make me to realize that there's so much in the word of God that he wants us to understand. Things that people came against me in the past, like, for instance, the Nephilim giants and the origin of demonic spirits and various things like that. And people didn't want me to necessarily preach it, thinking that if we had new people in the church, that it might scare them away. All right, that you hold that thought in your mind a little bit as we go. I'm not preaching on Nephilim today, but that's the point, you know. And so the Lord gave me that word, and then, and when the king commands, what do his servants do? They obey. So I've been on a journey since then of trying to obey the declaration of my king. I can't tell you that it's always been easy. There's been times that it's been hard. Lately, over the last year or so, since the Lord's really started moving. I find it to be a little bit more difficult, believe it or not, than some of the times in the past. And I'll try to explain a little bit about that. But just as a pastor is supposed to lead a congregation, believers are supposed to be part of a congregation. And could you turn to Hebrews chapter 10 for me? Uh, I want to say that again. Just as a pastor leads a congregation, believers, if, if you're a true believer... You're supposed to be part of a congregation. Not it doesn't have to be this congregation. Let me say that on the video. You might be sitting at home watching the video today. Maybe you felt a little under the weather. That's perfectly fine. That's understandable. People sometimes feel under the weather. They stay home. Right? So we're gonna read Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23 through 25. I believe the apostle Paul wrote the book of Hebrews, but scholars don't seem to be able to prove it. So here we go. Let us hold fast. The profession of our faith. I didn't know if I planned on doing it, but oops, chalkboard all over the place. So, in the, sometimes that word profession is actually translated in the English word as confession, but the Greek word is this. Y'all heard me use this word before, homologia. All right? And this is a compound word, like I told y'all in the past. Most Greek words are compound words. And so if you take the first word, homo, a lot of times we pronounce that homo, meaning same, right? That's what the word means, same. Logia means say. So a confession or a profession in this context means same say, say the same thing. Well, what are you saying the same thing whenever you profess your faith? You're saying the same thing that God says. What does God say? That you were born a sinner in Adam, and that you can be born again in Christ. And then you one day heard that story and you professed Christianity. You, you got saved. You said, 
Yes, Lord, I believe you died on the cross once you enter into my heart and once you saved me. And then if you did get saved and you felt that witness I was telling you about and the Holy Spirit moved in, now you're a professing Christian. You confess your Christianity. Like, in other words, you might go out in public and somebody says, hey, hey, man, you want to do a little something, something? And you're like, no, I used to do that. That was the old man. I don't do that anymore. I, I got to tell you something. I'm professing Christianity. I, I'm, I was an old man, but I'm a new man. New man don't do what old man did. Hallelujah. No, he don't. He's not supposed to. You don't keep living in darkness whenever you've been translated into the marvelous light. There's a separation. That's why you got to choose what church you're supposed to go to. Because they might not tell it to you like that down the road. And if you're comfortable going to that church, that's where you ought to be. If you want to still keep getting drunk, if you still want to go into the ballroom, if you still want to gamble, anything that has an addictive spirit to it has a demon spirit connected to it. Amen. That's what I'm going to preach. I'm going to tell you what I believe to be the truth. Why are you going to do that, preacher? Don't you want to build up your congregation? More, more than that, I want to stand before the Lord and not find out you didn't, you weren't faithful. Amen. You weren't faithful in what I called you to do. There ain't nobody in this room is going to stand on the side of me when I stand before the Lord. I'm going to be all by myself. All by myself. Me and the Lord. Yes, you, yes, you will too. You will give an account for your life. That's right. But your homologi, your confession, so your prophetic. So he says, hold fast the homologi of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. Amen? Then he says this, let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Got to consider you. I know I'm not supposed to walk out the frame of the camera because it messes things up. But guess what? We're not here for a production. Here for a point. It'd be kind of like, hey, Bill, it's good to see you again. I want to just provoke you to some good works. What's up, Mike? I appreciate the fact that you've been living for the Lord. And sometimes people that live in the world get on your nerves. Kind of soften it up sometimes, brother. Hey, Dave, how you doing, man? Good to see you again. I want to provoke you, brother, to some good works, Sister Bridget. Hallelujah. Josh, provoke you. I want to provoke you to some good works. Amen? And you're doing a great job, Mike. And I mean that. Praise God. Living for the Lord. Thank you for telling people about Jesus at the bank, Yvette. Thank you for showing up to church today, Rich, and playing the guitar. Thank you for Pamela for intercessory prayer. Thank you, Sabrina, for sharing your testimony. I want to provoke you. I need you to provoke me. I need you to, I want to encourage you to provoke the pastor to stay strong yes. in the faith and to do what it is that he's called to do. <laughs> provoke you to love and good works. Not forsaking, verse 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Look at this. As the manner of some is, he's talking to you. <laughs> and he's talking to some of you. Because some of you are just watching the video, but you go to another church somewhere. Praise God. Thank you for watching the video. I hope it helps you. But if you're sitting on your couch and you're not going to church anywhere, you're outside the will of God. Come on. James said, he that knows to do right and doesn't do it to him, it is sin. We are not to forsake the gathering of the brethren. It is in the word of God. It's not Pastor Matt saying it. Pastor Matt is just reading what the word of God says. That's all he's doing. Trying to be a faithful pastor. Praise God. Look at this. As the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. This is the part I want you to see. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. Wow. Because, see, we all agreed in this room right here, and I would imagine 90% of the people that watch the video would agree that we're in the last days. What does that mean exactly, Pastor? I don't know. He hasn't given me a date, and I wouldn't tell you if he did, because then, you know, if it don't come to pass, then guess what you are. But the point is this. It just seems like it's getting so dark. Yeah. But I know that in the midst of the darkness, he wants our light to shine. That's right. Amen. Hallelujah. And so believers need to know where they're called to go to church. This is part of my message because I'm talking about the helmet of salvation. And I'm talking about getting pummeled by the enemy in the head with, with lies and with second guesses 
and with thoughts. And then the fact that division can come in. You know, I had some things written in here that I took out, but I don't know. Someone said I'm supposed to take it out. You know, if you have 100 people in the room, we, we could all have varying little opinions about specific yes. things that we like about ministry and we don't like about ministry. And my question is, should we just put everything up in ministry to a vote? <laughs> I mean, look, there's a lot of things. I mean, Sabrina said that there was one thing, and I think I probably know what she's talking about, one thing out of all these years, and a long time, that we didn't agree on. And I don't even know that we completely disagreed. I might not have even explained it as best as I could have, or whatever. Maybe you're right, I'm wrong. I can be wrong. We're not gonna always agree on everything. Look, look, for instance, when we started this church, let me just say it on, on here. When we started this church, I was extremely pre-tribulation rapture. I'm not that anymore. I don't even know if you knew that. It's up to, now you know. It's up to, you know what? That gives you an opportunity. If that my pastor's not pre-trib, I didn't know that. Now I got to go find another church. Okay, <laughs> okay. Now let me say that I'm not saying that to provoke you to anger. No. As a matter of fact, as I've transitioned to what I believe now, I've been very careful about yes. that to not disclude anybody. And I realize we have a mixture of people in this church. Some believe pre-trib. Some believe. In more of a midweek kind of rapture. And this is the thing. We should be able to coexist. That's right. Come on. It's not a hallelujah. It's not like I'm preaching rapture every week. And what I would say is this. If you're right and it's pre-trip. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm out of here. Oh, no, you're not a pastor because you don't believe in the preacher ever after. Somebody tried to tell Aaron that. Well, tell like, dude, did you preach your Bible? Because that's not what gets you in or out. Yeah. <laughs> that's my head on that one. Now, that's a sign. If you think that I'm going to miss because that shows me you didn't read your Bible. So if you didn't read your Bible about that, did you really read your Bible about the rapture? Because I can promise you one thing. There's a whole lot more dissection that has to go on the rapture than it does justification by faith. That's right. But if you're right, hallelujah. And if my interpretation was close to the right, you're a little bit better prepared than you were before. That's right. If you happen to be alive when it goes down. That's another story for another time, right? So I didn't even mean to get into that. Other than the fact that there's differing opinions and everybody's yes. got opinions. Yes. And I can't bow to people's opinions. I got to bow to Jesus. I got to bow to the will of God. I have to answer for that. And it's not always easy. Because I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings contrary to anybody's opinion. That's not what I like to do. I've never been a popular. I was not even a popular kid, I got to tell you. I was not a popular kid because I was obnoxious. So if you need to pray for something on me, you need to pray that I quit being so obnoxious. I think I've gotten a lot better. Amen? I think I Gabby's like, no, dude. You got to go. <laughs> She's like, Pat, you're a mess. No. Praise God. So... We need to know, people need to know where they need to go to church. Yes. They need to pray, and when he answers, go there and serve. Yes. Pray for the ministry, pray for the pastor, wherever you are. But if you're a believer, then it's unacceptable, according to God's word, for you not to be in the house of God. So are you saying that it's possible people here today are not called to be here? I'm saying you must pray and hear from God where you're supposed to be, because you walk into the attack of a hornet's nest right. and you aren't ready to submit to God and you aren't sure that you're supposed to be here. Okay, I mean, A, you're not ready to submit to God. That could be one problem. Or B, you're not positive you're supposed to be here. It may not be both. It might be one or the other. If you're not positive you're supposed to be here, you're going to be taking unnecessary headshots. So now the next question is this. Why would people be feeling such an attack from the enemy whenever they walked into this place versus if they went to another church? Now, I've, had, I've heard people, nobody's come to me, and it's been more than one, so don't think that anybody's talking about your business. It's been more than one that said, that I heard said, everything was fine when I was over there, and then I came over here. So either number one, we're doing everything wrong, and God's angry, or we're trying to move forward to do things according to the word of God. And the devil's mad. Yes. Yeah. And the devil's trying to cause confusion and division. Yeah. Okay. It's one or the other. All right. He definitely doesn't cause confusion. So it's definitely not God causing confusion. All right. 
And so, you know, <clears throat> then the next question would be, well, why would you even say something like that, asking everybody whether or not they know for sure they're even in the right church? I mean, I, I care about you, whether you come to my church or not. I want to be the kind of pastor. See, listen to me. You got to understand something. I've been in a lot of churches. I've, I've sat in one church for 10 years. I've sat in another church for 13 years. I've sat in other churches for long, for not longer than that, but for long enough to know. I've been in enough services to know. See, you want to talk about a control spirit. Sometimes control spirits seem a lot sweeter than Pastor Matt. But it has a stronger hold on people. That's right. Yes. That's Somebody right. sent me a video the other day of a pastor who told people to go out in the grass and eat grass like a cow, and they went out there and they did it. Oh, anyway, I know that's very weird. But, but what I'm but what I'm trying to say is this: is, is that sometimes there's a control spirit that wants to hold people in bondage, and even sometimes they believe that they're in the right place because they've created close connections yeah. with people that they're in the church with and that makes sense because we're supposed to be able to bond with one another in Christ but sometimes there is there is a level of un, uncleanness or a level now uncleanness maybe isn't the right word but it could be uncleanness uh, a level of compromise Right. within the walls of the church. And listen, we've all had compromise in our life. I'm not sitting here trying to preach sinless perfection. I'll be the first to raise my hand and tell you, I mean, I've been very transparent as a, pa as a pastor, and you can't say I haven't. Uh, but a level of compromise that's running through the filters of the church where people think that it's okay to go out to eat and to get a glass of wine and put it on the glass. And you may think that way too, but, I just, if, you did, if, but if you didn't know it, your pastor doesn't agree with that. And one of the main reasons I don't agree with that is because I did it one time as a believer. And one of the, and the pastor's son showed up in the restaurant. And for some reason, obviously I wasn't as free about it as I thought because I was trying to hide it behind the little Tampico's on the table. What you been And then he said, oh, I didn't know you drank wine. Hallelujah. I didn't get to tell her at the one of court service, but I should have told Sister Anita, thank you for addressing me on that. Yeah. Way back then when you did. That's right. Because I needed to be addressed. Because you know what? I could have been part of the problem that caused problems in her son's life later on. Oh, well, if, that, if Matt now, I thought Matt was loved the Lord. If it's okay with him, it's okay with me. And start off with a couple of glasses, and the next thing you know, I'm throwing down some 40s. You get the point. So just to let you know that this, this pastor's not, oh, now you do what you want. You're welcome to come to this church. I just want you to know your pastor doesn't agree with that. As a matter of fact, I still want you in the church even if you believe that way. Amen. Because I believe that if you'll sit here and hang out long enough, then you might start to be like, well, you know what? That stuff hadn't really helped me out. As a matter of fact, it's been hurting me. I want more of the Holy Spirit. So don't think that just because you might sip wine on the weekend or you out there watching video that you're not welcome in this church because that's not true because the, the pastor at times in his own Christian walk has done more than sip wine, okay? Amen. And I'm not proud of that, but I'm just being honest because the process of Christianity, it's an ongoing journey. But don't sit here and think that it's okay, especially if it's prevent. It's going to hinder your walk with God. It's going to hinder your closeness with God, and especially if you're in a barroom in the world. Okay, I'm not even going there today because that's not my message. So why would you do it? Because it's war time, my friend. It's not just about the political agenda and who the next candidate is going to be. It's not about trying to win something in a voting booth. Do I believe you need to go in the voting booth and pull the right lever? Yes. Do you think that I want a good president? Yes. Do you think I love my American civil liberties? You better believe it. But if you think that this thing that's going on here is about America, you are in the wrong church at the wrong time in your life. This is about this world. This is about the, the, the wrestling match. This is about the war. This is about the dark entities that are trying to destroy your life, destroy your family, destroy this nation, destroy this world. This is about the fact that the evil has a plan and they're trying to put a chip in somebody's hand. They're trying to put some mark on your hand. The number 666, the mark of the beast. This is about the enemy trying to steal people's souls, man. It's war time. Yeah. What kind of war? I'm glad you asked. A Gideon war. 
Judges chapter 7, verses 2 through 3. The Lord said unto Gideon, The people that are with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands. Lest Israel vaunt themselves or be puffed up with pride against me. Saying, My own hand has saved me. Now therefore go to proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead. And there returned of the people 22,000, and there remained 10,000. The Lord said, you know what? It's still too many. Got to cut them down some more. So he said, make them go to the water, and the ones that lap water like a dog, keep them, and the ones that get on their knees, send them back home. Now, I don't know. I don't know. I thought that I would think that a human being lapping water like a dog would get on their knees. But the Lord was very clear. So the only way you can go home and study the text for yourself, please do. If you see a different way, let me know that all this is over for discussion. You can bring it up in Bible study and I will talk about it. He specifically said the ones that get on their knees are discounted. But the ones that lap like a dog, keep them. The only way I know how to say like that and be like this. Like that. See what I'm saying? And so what are they doing? They're being watchful. They're being vigilant. And they're looking because, see, you can have a church of a thousand people and everybody's just like, I don't want to be ugly. La, 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 holding hands, kumbaya, <laughs> kumbaya, everything's good. And it's not really good. And it's nothing but a social gathering. And I'm not trying to pick on other churches because, praise God, we just got to find where we belong. I'm convinced we're in the last days. I'm convinced it's bigger than just voting for the right candidate. I'm convinced we're in a battle. And I'm convinced the Lord is going to give us the victory. Now, what it looks like in the end and how we have, what we have to go through or what we don't have to go through, I don't have the final answer. But I can promise you, I'll continue to look for him. And I'll continue to ask you your opinion as we seek the Lord together. But he whittled it down to 300. And he gave Gideon a victory. Scripture says to be sober, be vigilant for your adversary the devil roams around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. I want to tell you this. I'm going to share something else with you. Some of you already know this, but if he's telling you that you don't belong in this church, I want you to know you've been talking to me too. I've shared with a couple of people, not a lot, but I'm about to just open it up. <laughs> that, you know, I've been, doing, I've been preaching the gospel for a long time and I, I haven't had a lot of negativity. I mean, I've had people say things about us through the years, say things about me. I mean, but that's to be expected. Lately, though, the attack in my mind has been different. One day I was standing up here. I'd never had that happen before. And all of a sudden, and I'm not, listen, I'm not saying anything for, for you to pity me because I don't need pity. <laughs> I'm saying this to you so that you know that I'm going through some stuff too and I'm asking you to pray for you, Okay. So when I was standing up here one time and I was praying, and there was just a couple of people that would look tired. I mean, come on, everybody's tired, dude. You've worked out this heat lately? Give me a break. Everybody's tired. So Jeremiah, the Lord told Jeremiah, don't even look at their faces. So I'm not even supposed to look at nobody's face. Am I supposed to turn around and pray, preach like this? <laughs> anyway, all of a sudden, he said, look at them. And he said, this way, shut your mouth, you fool. They don't even want to hear what you have to say. You know, and then, and then recently, he's been saying, this whole church would be better off without you. No, I'm just telling you what he said. No. Not, you know, just bear with me. I, I know it's a lot. Hallelujah. <laughs> Thank you, Lord, that you gave me a promise in a ballroom bathroom, and you spoke a word to me, and you said you will present my word for the way that it's written, and I will use you. And that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to listen to that voice. Amen. And I'm not going to listen to the voice of a liar, but that's what he, that's what he, this church would be better off without you, dude. They'd probably finally grow. They got the right preacher in there that said the right thing and people liked it. Then maybe some people would stay in your church. And that means a lying devil. I'm going to keep on telling the truth of what I read in this prep, in this book right here, whether people like it or not. I'm not trying to make people mad, I promise. You know what's interesting is I was feeling that last week, okay? And I was like, you know what? The only preacher that I can, not that there's no preachers that 
but there's a guy that I've been tapping into, Naya's old uh, guy, David Wilkers. So I was like, let me see what old David. So I'm scrolling through, and I can't remember what the title of the message was. I clicked on that. I never knew this about that brother. This dude was the preacher for Catherine Coleman for a period of time. I never knew that. That's just such an interesting awesome. connection. Okay, if you don't even know who Catherine Coleman is, it's no big deal. But if you know who she is, it's kind of like, what? Yeah. So the story is, is that she had a 5,000 seated auditorium and people would flock there. And, he, and what he said in this, in this message was this, that he was her preacher. She got, now that tells me something about Catherine Coleman because she purposely picked him to come preach the sermon. So she wanted a preacher. Some people don't want preachers. She wanted a preacher. I want somebody to come in there and I want them to preach the gospel. And he said she was in charge of the, of the choir. But then, yeah, she was flamboyant. She'd have the flow and dress, and that's what she was doing. She was up there doing all this number here, and they had an orchestra, and they had a choir, and they were singing, and she was giving glory to God, and the Holy Spirit fall in that place, and people were getting healed left and right. People would travel from all over the place getting healed, and then that brother would get up there, and he'd preach the gospel with everything that was in him. And one day, he said he was up there getting ready to preach, and, he, and Satan spoke to him. Like just at the same time that the enemy is trying to trying to convince me of something, I find this video and this great mighty man of God says in this video that Satan came to him and said, You're a phony, shut your mouth. And that man said he walked off the stage. Catherine said, What what are you doing? Where are you going? He said, I'm a phony, I can't do it. That breaks my heart. You ever heard that brother preach? Dude. What I like about it is, and then no, times are different though. Times are different today. But anyway, you know what I like about it? One time he was preaching a message and he said they told him, you, when it, you know, he came from Iowa and, he, and the Lord called him to the streets of New York City. He, he got, you know, his, one of his first converts was Nikki Cruz, a Puerto Rican yes, gang leader. Yes. Oh, and he's crossing the switchblades in the name of the sport. Yes. He walked up to Nikki Cruz and told him that Jesus loved him. And Nikki Cruz said, you say that again, man, I'm going to bust your face in. He said, Jesus loves you. He beat the, beat the dog mess out of him, put him in the hospital. First thing David Wilkerson does after he gets out of the hospital bed, he goes and finds Nikki Cruz and he says, <laughs> Jesus loves you. Nikki Cruz gives his heart to Jesus and been serving God oh, ever God. since. Oh, Hallelujah. God. So he starts this church. It comes from uh, cornfields of Iowa, I believe it is. He goes to New York City. He leaves prostitutes and gang members. He starts Times Square Church and he's preaching this message and he said, and, and dude, it's so good. <laughs> oh my God, he ain't scared of nobody. So he's got a church full of millionaires off of Wall Street and they're over there. He said, you, you used to have a hammer in your hand and now I gotta go find you at the office because you won't even come to church on a Sunday night. Oh, they told me when we started the church not to have church on Sunday nights because that's TV night and that's when everybody, he said, no, as long as the Holy Spirit's moving on the hearts of people, hallelujah, we're we're going to have church. And he said, and if you think I'm trying to have a church drive campaign, we got standing room only back here. He said, that's not what we're trying to do. The word of God says you're supposed to be in church. Anyway, he walked off that stage, going back to that other store. And there was a pastor back there. And he told the pastor, same thing, I'm a phony and I can't do it. He stayed out of the pulpit for, I think, three or four weeks or four months, I don't remember. I was just thinking, man, the enemy... Whenever you start to try to do the work of God, he wants to shut your mouth. He wants to shut my mouth. He wants to shut your mouth. And I believe that if the people of God, would, he doesn't want people to unify, that have like mind, or of one mind and one accord. Because if we can come together on what the big purpose is in glorifying Jesus, and we can bring our praise and our worship into this house, and we can give glory to the Lord, the Holy Spirit start moving, amen, and we can be solidified. To, to, to minister to people no matter how many people we have in here. It's about quality instead of quantity. I believe that with all my heart. God can do a great work. So that's what I that's what I that's what he's been telling me, but I'm not leaving. Amen. I know what God told me. Praise God. So what I plan to do is to gird my loins with truth, put on my breastplate of righteousness, shod my feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, pick up my shield of faith and wield my sword. Amen. So let's close with two things, the sword and the prayer. The, sir, the word sword right there, it says that it is the word of God. I can find so many scriptures. I can keep you here for a week about the word of God. But let me just use one, Hebrews 4.12. It says, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and it's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents 
of the heart. See, you get along with the word of God and let the Holy Spirit have his way. You and your word. By the way, I want to like really challenge you and provoke you to good works. You need to read your Bible. It's not good enough. I don't care how hard I work and how much scripture I present. And I present a lot of scripture. It's not enough. You need to read your word for yourself. You either need to read it or you need to listen to it. You need to get it in. Amen? I hope that's okay, but that's just the truth. It's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. If you will let the word of God have its way in your heart, he will begin to reveal to you what's really in you. Amen? Last thing I want to tell you about is prayer. And singers, musicians, y'all can come forward. I'd like to give people an opportunity this morning if you'd like to respond to the message in the sense that you would say, you know what? I do believe that I uh, that the enemy's been attacking me. And uh, I, I do b- believe that I want the Holy Spirit to minister to me in this area and that I truly want to hear the voice of God and walk in God's will. I just want after whenever I step down, I just want you to know the altars are open. We can worship together um, and we can believe God together that God's going to continue to lead us and guide us. Amen. But at the end of Ephesians in well, in verses 18 and 19, he says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching there unto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Praying always. I can't tell you how important I believe prayer is. I believe prayer is more important today than, it's ever, than I've ever realized it before. Prayer in the Word of God is so important in our walk and in doing ministry. You're, some of you, your favorite preacher that, that you listen to all the time on the radio... Now, everything of his ministry was birthed in prayer. Everything. Every, every real mighty man of God was a man that prayed. Yeah. The people of God that are going to see things accomplished for God pray. And so that's the kind of church we're going to be. We're going to be the kind of church that we're either going to be witnesses on the outside in some of these areas, right? Where we go to jails and we go to nursing homes or we pray with people in Walmart. Or we're going to be intercessory prayer warriors on the nights of prayer at the altar if you make it at some of the times. Or you might be somebody in the music ministry. Amen. Or you're going to be somebody, hopefully, that's studying your word and praying for your church and praying for your walk with God. Because what we're not going to be is the church that has a small group setting for shooting guns together, for riding Harleys together. Again, I'm not against Harley riders. And I'm not against gun shooters. And I, I'm, that, that's not the issue. The issue is we're going to be our best to be like the book of Acts and to ask God to give us the signs and the wonders and the, and the miracles that follow the preaching of the truth of God's yeah. word. Amen. Yeah. Lastly, verse 19 says, and prayer for me. Well, he didn't say the word prayer, but that's what he was talking about. Prayer for me, the preacher. Amen. That utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Amen.